the Weizmann Institute, and today I want to tell you about this work, Preference Informed Fairness, with my awesome collaborators, Michael, Alexandra, and Guy. Okay, getting the clicker to work is obviously the hardest part of this talk. Okay, so I'll jump right into the setting. So we have a collection of individuals that I'm gonna call X, a collection of outcomes that I'm gonna call C. Um, right, so you can think of this as kind of binary classification, loan, yes or no, medical treatment, yes or no, but more generally as kind of anything we want to allocate. So maybe this is a collection of advertisements. Um, and our objective is going to be to map individuals to outcomes, right, in a way that provides strong protections against discrimination. Okay, so this is a very kind of standard setting. So a natural question is what do we actually do in this work? Um, so our main contribution, I'd say, is definitional. So we take two kind of standard notions, individual fairness and envy freeness, and we argue that there are cases where kind of both of them don't really capture what we want. And we give a new definition that in some sense interpolates or combines, gets the both wor best of both worlds. Um, and we do a bunch of other stuff, but I want to use my next uh, seven minutes to give you some intuition for the definition. So we heard about individual fairness 20 minutes ago. I'm going to assume you remember nothing. Um, so the idea is to formalize the notion that similar individuals are treated similarly. So there's two notions of similarity here between individuals and between outcomes. So formally, I'm going to say that an allocation that is randomized is individually fair with respect to this two metric if this kind of upper bound holds for every individual I with respect to every other individual J. Okay, and the easiest way to understand this is through an example. So suppose I'm in the receiving a loan, yes or no, and kind of I'm talking about an ideal metric now, so maybe individuals are similar if they are both kind of equally credit worthy. Okay, so now note that if I have two individuals that are equally credit worthy, this constraint essentially means that they have to see, to get the loan with the same or equal probability. Okay, so this is kind of a very strong requirement that really doesn't let me do any kind of bad distinctions. Uh, but now I can slightly change this example in a way that makes it look not as reasonable. So now I'm allocating interview slots. So think of these as like graduate students and Google, Facebook, Netflix. And I'm concerned about discrimination. So maybe now the metric is kind of are two students equally qualified, yes or no. And now note that if these two individuals are equally qualified, but one is getting the Facebook interview and the other is getting the Netflix interview, this allocation is not individually fair. Right, they're similar, but they're getting very, very different outcome distributions. And this is also true when kind of, I don't know if you can see this, but when this is kind of every individual's favorite outcome, right? So he wants the Facebook and she wants the Netflix interview. So this doesn't seem to make sense. And really the issue is that this notion of treat like alike can be overly restrictive when individuals differ in their preferences over the outcome space. So I mentioned preferences, so just to say what this kind of means, I'm going to assume that every individual has a binary relation over this entire outcome space. So I can compare two allocations and say which they prefer. And there's a very natural notion once I'm talking about preferences uh, from the fair division literature. This is Envy Frina, so there they're thinking about dividing a cake and they care about fairness. Um, and the idea is kind of that every individual prefers their part of the cake. Okay, so the way this is formalized is kind of for every individual I with respect to every other individual J, I prefers their allocation, pi of I over pi of J. Um, okay, so going back to this example that we had before, note that this was not individually fair, but this is like the prototypical envy free allocation, right? Because everyone is getting their favorite outcome, so of course no one wants to switch with anyone else. So this seems to make a lot of sense, but note that this argument didn't use the fact that these two individuals are similar at all. Okay, so I can now consider two other individuals. They don't have the same GPA, and you know, the one that's getting the Facebook interview is envious of the one getting the Netflix interview because she wants the Netflix interview. Okay, but kind of if you think about it, if you have few Netflix interviews, then some people are gonna be unhappy, okay? So this is kind of exactly the conceptual contribution of individual fairness, which is to use the metric to make distinctions between outcome distributions that make some people unhappy as opposed to outcome distributions that are kind of inherently unfair. Uh, okay, so this time kind of envy freeness is, is also overly restrictive, but this time when individuals differ in their qualification for the task. 
So we have these two kind of overly restrictive under different circumstances and naturally kind of the question is can we get the best of both worlds? And I'm assuming that you can get, guess the answer. Of course we can and this is our paper. Um, so I wanna kind of tell you a bit about what we're doing. So the idea is to start with individual fairness but then use information about the preferences to relax it. And once I start talking about relaxing individual fairness, I have to kind of make this distinction between relaxations that are considered okay versus not okay. So I'm gonna say that deviations are okay as long as they're kind of aligned with the individual's preferences. Okay, and the easiest way to see this is through an example. So kind of this is the third time you're seeing this. Remember, this was not individually fair. So I'm gonna say that it is preference informed fair and the argument would kind of use the same interpersonal relationships comparisons of individual fairness. So they are similar, right? So I'm gonna compare this guy uh, to her. And now I'm going to ask this kind of counterfactual question which is, okay, under individual fairness, you would receive the Netflix interview because you're similar and that's what she gets. Do you prefer your current outcome? Okay, note that the answer is yes, and I can do exactly the same thing uh, from her perspective, and again, the answer is yes, because she's getting something she prefers. So this is going to be preference-informed fairness, and the formal definition just kind of breaks this down, so I'm gonna ask that for every individual I with respect to every other individual J, there exists this fictitious allocation that in some sense I'm imagining that is individually fair with respect to J's allocation, but that I kind of prefers what they're getting right now. And we kind of characterize the relationships between all three definitions in the paper. Um, we have kind of some more discussion about, you know, um, maybe subjects that are more related to this crowd, which is like, why is this a good idea and where did the preferences come, come from and can we get more biases, you know, by using this approach if we don't get the preferences right. Um, I do want to mention that kind of we have some discussion about using preference to relax other notions of fairness, so not just individual fairness. Um, we heard yesterday about a couple of talks that are doing like parity constraints on, you know, in targeted advertising, and I really think that this logic makes a lot of sense there, right? We're kind of enforcing some constraints that the number of women and the number of ed should, men should see the same ad, but maybe this is like actually not what these individuals want. Um, and I'll use my last 20 seconds to end with this kind of takeaway message, which is there's the question of whether we want to incorporate fairness constraints, but if we do and we want to do it into more of these like real world systems, I really think we should kind of give more thought to the fairness definitions we're using, not just take them for granted and kind of think about whether we're sufficiently modeling all the aspects that are relevant to this problem. And here I kind of you know, put this light on preferences, which is something we should model, but there could be other stuff. Okay, thank you.